Fire Emblem has had skill systems since way before the series came west, but for a lot of folks like me, the first introduction to skills in Fire Emblem was in Fire Emblem The Sacred Stones, the eighth game in the series, but only the second to release in America. Sacred Stones introduced skills primarily for a small selection of promoted units such as bishops, generals, and snipers. And almost all skills in FE8 fall into one of two camps. Proc skills, or skills that have a percentage chance of activating, and activated skills, which add a new menu option for a unit under certain conditions. A classic example of this is a Thief's Steal feature. Skills are a mainstay part of modern Fire Emblem games and a big part of what makes your units work, but in Sacred Stones, most of the skills pretty much suck. Let's have a look at each skill, as well as how skills work broadly in FE8, what works about them, what doesn't work, and how good they are. We'll start with the Sacred Stone skills that I think work the best, Summoning and Thief Utility. These are the types of skills that appear as a new menu option for units that have them. Thief Utility doesn't really work much differently in FE8 compared to FE7, but it is a skill in this game. This includes using lockpicks to open doors and chests, and stealing items like stat boosters off of enemies. I'm not going to spend too much time on these skills, as they aren't really new to FE8, but these skills are pretty cool in that they act as a way to turn a weak combat unit like a thief into sort of a side objective. Thieves are weak and squishy in FE8, so the reason you deploy one is for opening chests or stealing items. In effect, thief skills turn thieves from useless units you would never deploy into escort missions. You have to take this weak unit and get them to the chests that you want to open. This is usually pretty easy, but stealing from enemies can be harder as that requires you to create a safe path for your thief to steal from an enemy before that enemy dies, and then you typically need to kill the enemy so that they don't kill the thief on their turn. Thief skills are most prevalent in the early game because eventually you are able to buy keys and shops, so you only really need to bring a thief to a map if there's something you need to steal after that. And the stealables on most maps aren't usually that exciting, it's often gems in a game that gives you plenty of money, although there are a couple stat boosters worth stealing later in the game, such as a Speedwing in Floorspar's Oath and a Draco Shield in River of Regret. Thief utility is pretty nice in the early game though, before keys become viable. There's a few important chests for our Thief Colm to open, which include an Angelic Robe and an Elysian Whip, plus a stealable energy ring in Chapter 7. So your thief feels like a decently big deal in the early game, and the steal skills work well in this game, but it's unfortunate that you can buy keys because this makes thieves not feel super valuable past the early game. I usually don't deploy a thief again after the route split, except for chapter 15 for the desert items. The other skill that, like thief utility, adds a new menu item is summon, which is accessible to the summoner class, and it's a pretty cool skill. It allows you to create a 1 HP phantom that can fly over terrain, bait enemies, or attack eggs in that one map where you need to kill a bunch of gorgon eggs. And this is one of the coolest skills in the game because it opens up some new strategic options by providing you with something that's hard to come by in a game with permadeath, a truly expendable unit. You can send summons into dangerous situations without a worry, and you can use them to manipulate the AI into attacking them instead of your less expendable units. And if you have the patience, you could even take out certain enemies by spawning summons over and over again until they finally overwhelm the enemy's defense with their random axes. Summoning is a cool skill because all of its use cases may not be immediately obvious. They're 1 HP summons that can't do much damage. But once you learn how they work and how the AI loves to attack them, it's fun figuring out how to make the best use of them. I love the stealing skills and summoning skills because they can both change how you're going to approach a map, and they're also very predictable. There's some RNG elements to summon, such as what axe they spawn with, and that can spice things up a bit, but a lot of what summons can do is pretty reliable. For example, they can always bait enemies and they can always fly over terrain. The relative consistency of these skills makes it worth thinking about how you want to use them and how you can implement them into your strategy. And I think having these extra options that you can plan around and incorporate into your strategy is fun. But the opposite of these highly consistent skills are proc skills, or skills with a percentage chance of activating, and those are really common in FE8, so let's take a look at those next. First up we have Great Shield, which is available to generals, and this skill provides a percentage chance of negating all damage from an enemy's attack. There are two things about this skill that make it a little awkward. First, its activation rate is a percentage equal to the level of your opponent, the second is that General isn't a great class for this skill in this game. The activation rate being enemy level percent is awkward partly because of how that interacts with promotions. It's just based on the displayed level of the enemy, meaning against a level 15 mage you have a 15% chance of proccing Great Shield, 
but if that mage promotes into a level 1 sage, now you have a 1% chance of proccing Great Shield. So if you get a general early, this skill can actually start to feel worse once enemies start to promote. Additionally, tying the proc rate to enemies stats just feels a little lame because it means investing in your general never makes the skill any better because it's tied totally to the enemy. The other reason I don't like Great Shield on General and Sacred Stones is that generals are frequently already taking really low amounts of damage, so a low chance to negate damage isn't too useful against physical enemies that can barely hurt you anyway. Hypothetically, this skill could be valuable for when you fight mages or effective weapons, but the proc rate is usually pretty low, so you don't really want to be relying on this skill to bail you out. So I don't like this one, both because it's unreliable and because generals already have high bulk, so negating an attack often doesn't feel super important for them. Another proc skill I dislike for similar reasons is Sure Shot. This is the sniper skill, and it gives you a guaranteed hit with a proc rate equal to the level of the attacking unit. So a level 10 Innis has a 10% chance to proc Sure Shot, for example. Much like Great Shield, the proc rate just feels really low here. The highest it can ever be is 20%, but you spend most of the game lower than that. But perhaps more importantly, snipers like Innis already have good accuracy. So it's an unreliable proc rate, and most of the time when it does proc, you didn't need it anyway. I think this skill in particular shows that skills that really accentuate already existing strengths are often no good. If you're already excellent at something, often becoming a little better at it isn't a huge difference maker. But becoming better at something you're just okay at, or only pretty good at, can make a bigger difference. Though in this case, even if the skill did something really good, the proc rate is just too low to be relied upon. And speaking of difficult to rely on, our next skill is Silencer. And this is another one that existed in FE7, but is made into a skill for FE8. Silencer is the assassin skill, and its chance of activation is equal to half of your critical hit chance. That rate is further reduced by 50% against bosses, and is 0% against the final boss. When Silencer activates, it instantly kills the target regardless of how much damage you were displayed to deal. Here's the thing about Silencer. Much like Sure Strike, it's pretty often overkill, a unit like Joshua critting often means the enemy is going to die anyway, but unlike Sure Shot, there are a lot more times when this is going to be useful because there are many bulky enemies that Joshua can't one-shot with a crit, or needs two crits to one-shot, and in those situations, the Silencer proc is pretty helpful. There is also a bit of additional upside here, as a unit like Joshua or Marissa will often need a crit and then their second attack to kill an enemy, so if Silencer procs on the first attack, you get to avoid a counterattack. Still, this skill is mostly useful against the tankier enemies that wouldn't die to a crit. The activation rate on this isn't going to be crazy high since assassins do not get the increased crit bonus that swordmasters get, but it's going to feel a little better than a lot of other level percent proc skills because those skills start with a 1% chance of activation because your unit will be level 1. Your assassin can easily have a crit rate in the 30 to 40 range by using a killing edge from the minute you promote them and that will mean you have an activation rate of silencer in the range of 15 to 20 percent or so. And as long as you have killing edges for your assassin to use, that's probably what the proc rate is going to look like for most of the game. Though that proc rate does get cut in half against bosses, who are some of the enemies you would really like this skill to work against because they tend to be the harder enemies to kill. One thing this skill nails that other proc skills don't is that it feels incredibly satisfying when you do proc it. The slightly different animation, the screen flash, it just feels really awesome, and that's the best part of the skill to me. Even when this skill activates against an enemy that you would have killed anyway, it feels really cool. So I'm big on the fun factor of this skill, but I'm not that high on the power factor. Just because it's difficult to rely on and you have to make sure you keep providing killing edges or it kind of stops working. If you run out of killing edges and you have to start handing your assassin silver swords or iron swords, the proc rate for this skill is going to plummet. But the skill is fun to use, and honestly, I think they put too many guardrails on this skill. I don't think it needs reduced rates against bosses, and I even think it should work on the final boss. I get why narratively it makes sense that Marissa can't proc Silencer on Faux Mortis, but I think the fun factor outweighs that for me. And it's not like it would break the balance of the boss, fishing for a Silencer would still be far from the best way to fight him. So I don't really know why they felt the need to reduce the proc rate of this skill against bosses. I really don't think it would break anything if Assassins had the normal Silencer proc rate against bosses, but it would make them a little more fun to use. So that was Silencer, and that brings us to our final proc skill, and I believe the best one, Pierce. 
Pierce is attached to the Wyvern Knight class, and it gives you a percent chance equal to your unit's level to ignore the enemy's defense for an attack. This is the same proc rate as Sure Shot, which is to say, not reliable. The highest the activation rate can ever be is 20%, but for much of the game it will be lower than that. However, the payoff for when Pierce activates is actually pretty nice. Ignoring defense is often an extra 10-20 to 20 points of damage depending on the enemy, and it's just free extra damage that happens sometimes. Randomly getting extra damage tends to be a little more valuable than randomly guaranteeing that you're already very accurate unit hits. Since Pierce's proc rate is per attack, you can also do something to make it a little more reliable like attack with a Brave Lance to increase your number of opportunities to activate it. A level 15 Wyvern Knight that attacks 4 times, for example, has just under a 50% chance of activating Pierce at least one time. That being said, even though this is the best proc skill, it's still a little too unreliable to plan around for my taste. Instead, Pierce is usually something I'm just happy to see when it activates, which is at least better than Great Shield or Shore Shot, which I often don't care about even when they do activate. This skill is pretty meaningful in rigged LTCs though, it's pretty funny watching Wyverns pierce through tons of enemies in those playthroughs where you can count on Pierce activating every attack. So that's all the proc skills in FE8, and my takeaway from them is that level isn't a great thing to tie skill activation rate to for a couple reasons. Tying activation rate to level means that the activation rate starts low and stays low for a while. You promote your unit, get an exciting new skill, and then it almost never procs for a while. This is especially an issue because the game isn't that long, so a lot of units don't spend a lot of time at a crazy high level. Take a unit like Erika Root Cormag. You get him at the end of chapter 13. So if you promote him instantly, he only has about 7 maps to use Pierce, and his activation rate starts at a sad 1%. Tying activation rate to his stat seems better to me. It means when you unlock the skill, the proc rate will be higher to begin with. If we tied Pierce to skill, for example, an instant promoted Cormag would have an 11% proc rate. So you might actually see it proc a few times in his early levels. Tying proc rate to his stats still allows the proc rate to grow over time as the unit levels up, and also adds a little extra player choice as you could decide to do something like use a secret book on Cormag for that juicy extra 2% proc rate. It also allows proc rate to creep past 20%, but it still won't get too high since non-HP stat caps are all 30 or less in FE8. And we don't really have to think about this hypothetically because tying proc rate to stats is what tends to be done in modern Fire Emblem games. Modern proc skills still don't tend to be super reliable, but I think they're a lot more fun because you actually get to see them activate more than once in a blue moon upon unlocking the skill. So I don't love using a unit's level as the percentage for their proc rate. However, the alternative used in FE8, enemy level percent, is just a disaster of a proc rate. You can't do anything to improve it, and even in the final map there are tons of enemies in the level 5 to 8 range, so the proc rate is often very bad. So while I don't love level percent as a proc rate, it is way better than enemy level percent as a proc rate. One funny quirk though of having both enemy level percent proc chances and level percent proc chances in the same game is that when a wyvern knight fights a general, the proc rates of Great Shield and Pierce will always be exactly the same. Sacred Stones has one more skill for us to touch on, and it's the opposite of a proc skill in that it just always does what it says it does, and that's Slayer. Slayer is the bishop skill, and it gives your weapons triple might when attacking monsters. People really like this skill, and it's pretty easy to see why. There are a lot of monsters in Sacred Stones, so for someone like Arthur using a Shine Tome, if you're on a map with a lot of monsters, Slayer is basically just providing an extra 12 might per attack, and that's pretty awesome. The only real limitation here beyond the obvious one that you need to be fighting monsters for Slayer to do anything is that a lot of monsters suck and Ardor can actually just kill them without Slayer. Most moguls and bonewalkers Slayer doesn't really help much against since you can kill them without it. However, Slayer is still pretty good because of bulkier monsters like Gargoyles and Bales and faster monsters like Mothdugs, which Arthur can't double but can one-shot with Slayer. So there's a lot of value to be had out of Slayer, particularly on Erika's big route maps with tons of monsters. After the route split, I think Slayer is a bit less of a big deal, as one-rounding beefier monsters isn't a difficult thing to do anymore. The game starts handing out legendary weapons like candy, and your best combat units can sweep a lot of monsters with just normal hand axes and javelins. So Slayer is still good, but being able to shoot down a gargoyle just doesn't feel like as special a thing as it did a few chapters ago. Still, Slayer is pretty nice in the mid-game, and it is funny that it lets units like Mulder and Natasha do big damage with light tomes against monsters, even if their stats aren't very great. 
This type of skill with a passive but conditional bonus is more interesting to me than the proc skills. Slayer is reliable, impactful, and feels exciting, plus it gives a unit like Arter an extra niche in fighting monsters. But it's not active all the time, so it gives Arter moments of greatness and maps where he really excels, while still leaving other maps while Arter will feel more like a normal unit. And I like when units are a little dynamic like that. Overall, if FE8 was your introduction to skills like it was for me, it's a bit of a rocky one. There aren't a ton of them, and the most common kind are very unreliable proc skills, some of which don't even feel that exciting when they do activate. But there are a few standouts. Silencer is inconsistent but good fun to use, and Pierce feels really good when it does activate. I think the non-proc skills are what really shine in FE8 though. Summoning makes the summoner class feel totally unique and memorable while opening up new strategic options, and Slayer creates niches for units that can access it. So at least we got a few interesting things out of what is probably my least favorite implementation of skills in a Fire Emblem game. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you liked it, consider hitting the like or subscribe button so that you never miss an upload, and if you want to chat about Fire Emblem more, check out the community discord linked in the video description. And as always, a big thank you to my geckos on Patreon, and a shout out to my skinks, Red Mage, Morgan, Chicken, Morg Wolf, Upscale Furry Trash, Cosplay Sylveon, Emma, Van West, Ike Poo, Lucy Sev, Romeo, Wingman, Lonely Voxel, Aaron Geddon, Mikabre, Stars to Art, Doopy, and the Noodle Doodler. I really appreciate all of your support. If you want to support the channel and appear in videos like this one, you'll find a link to the Patreon in the video description. Either way, thanks for hanging out, and have yourself a lovely week.